Welcome back to Blurry Creatures. Wow, 35 episodes. We've gone from cryptid sightings to newspaper accounts of the ancient giants to megalith construction to mounds in North America to modern day giant sightings. You know, you can go listen to a thousand uh, podcasts about people seeing beasts and creatures. And most of the time, it just remains mysterious. What are these things? Where they come from? Let's leave it a mystery. But not on Blurry Creatures. On Blurry Creatures, we are trying to find more concrete answers and dig into the history of the Bible and the origin story of humans and ask ourselves, is this all related? And so if you've been on this journey from the beginning till now, you've kind of seen the arc of the show. And before we get into the the topic, Luke, one thing you guys have been doing is sending us a lot of YouTube links and article links right. and your stories and all kinds of uh, materials to pour through. It's almost so much material, it's hard for us to to get through it. And, and one thing I want to say is that that all requires time. And really, when you know you become a member of this show, you're just allowing us to spend more time curating this content, digging through it, finding the stories, and recording those stories editing them down in an entertaining way and putting them back into your ears. So if you want to give us some more time to do this and create more material for you, head over to BlurryCreatures.com, become a member, and start listening to unreleased episodes and episodes early and engage in the conversation. We're going to be putting more and more materials over there. But the more of you guys jump on board, the more time we'll have to devote to this and 35 episodes could be 105 episodes rather quickly. And, you know, one of the things that I'm noticing in this show is is just this arc, this story arc. I love where we are right now because I feel like all the knowledge is compounding like a snowball. And I feel like a thousand times more comfortable in these interviews asking these questions because I feel like I have so much more information and it's all piecing together. And a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I listened to episode four of your podcast. It was great. I was like, man, you know, really, we're, we're going one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. You really got to right. go in, in in order. Yeah, I agree. Or you're going to miss it, right? Because it's a, a platform and a journey podcast, and we're not the experts, we're just asking the questions, I think it's a disservice not to start at the beginning and, and follow the arc, right? Because I would hope that everybody who's stuck with us from the beginning or is listening now would would listen up to this point because I do, I do think you're right. I think it builds on, it continues to build on itself. So we're peeling layers off the onion and there's multiple onions That's for our analogy. Right? It's the, it's the Bigfoot onion, but they all kind of all are the same vegetable layers. It's like Shrek, right? So ogre, ogre donkey. Yeah, dude, which is like the world is more like Shrek. And that's what we're learning is that all the weird creatures of the forest might actually be out there and the weird stuff. It all has an origin story. And you might just be tuning in to Blurry Creatures thinking, hey, these guys don't talk about Bigfoot. No, we're talking about Bigfoot. We're trying to get to the root of the story of where does that beast come from and how does it fit into right. this whole narrative. Yeah. So. And we've got talking donkeys, just like Shrek. Yeah. But I love it. I feel more comfortable. I feel good. You guys have been very supportive of the show so far. Again, you can email us, blurrycreaturespodcast at gmail.com or hit us up at blurrycreatures. If you're just tuning in, you know, we get heavy. We get We get hot and heavy sometimes, Luke. Just like Og's bed. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, Rich loved, loved it. He's like, I've been a lot of stuff happened there. <laughs> uh, it's These like giants were just naughty. Yeah. It's, I can't, we can't say enough for tuning into our show, sharing this show to your friends. A lot of people have been sharing it on Facebook and stuff, just screenshotting it, sharing it on Instagram. There's a million podcasts out there. And Luke and I put a lot more effort into this one than your average Joe podcast. Yeah, we're grateful. We're grateful that you listen. And, and you know what? Like we... We don't want everyone to agree with us. I think that's one thing I want to keep reiterating. That's not our point here. We welcome disagreement and dissent. This is a this is a marketplace, a free marketplace of ideas, and we're just asking questions. And we're going to continue to ask questions because there's a lot of questions to be asked, and there's a supply of questions, and there's not a lot of answers. So we are going to bring on Richard Sorensen and try to get some more answers about these ancient giants. Welcome to the show, Richard Sorensen. Uh, Richard, you have an MS in internet engineering, a BS in biology, 
where you studied evolution and Darwinism in depth. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're working on your PhD in psychology from North Central University, where you're focused on the human mind and consciousness. You've done countless research in Near Eastern archaeology, Nile Delta archaeology, psychology, biochemistry, uh, memory as we referenced, the Holy Shroud of Turin, the mystery of the Nephilim, the Great Pyramid, history of Christianity, early Christianity, Jewish history, biblical theology, and on and on and on. Um, we came across you, and, I was, and we were talking about this before we got on the show, but welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to have you, Rich. And we came across you as I was reading articles on academia.com, and it, it just is, it's random how things work, but I was reading some stuff about the Nephilim and especially about um, some demonology stuff about Baal and Baal's equivalence to the Satan and had, as it had to do with uh, Caesarea Philippi and, and a lot of that stuff. And, and I got recommended a couple of your papers. And so you've got quite the interesting and, and variety of papers. But we'll start from the top. One of the things that you like to write about and, and you've written about actually um, are the Nephilim and ancient giants, something that we like to cover here on the show, Nate. And yeah. Uh, from more of a uh, of a psychology point of view, which I think is fascinating, and then also you you wrote about uh, Ham's wife and, and her potential passing of the Nephilim genes. Uh, but Rich, great to have you. Thank Thanks you. for joining yeah. us. Thank you. Good to be with you. Yeah. So, Nate, one of our favorite topics here. Yeah, yeah. We talk about the giants all the time. It seems like. <laughs> it, we actually. So, did just did you tell him what we did? No, today? not yet. I was going to get into that right now. <laughs> so we. You know, Nate and I are, Nate's 40, I'm almost 40 here, and so we, we the other day, uh, Nate's family was out of town, and my wife was at a girl's night, so we decided that on our, our, our bachelor night, a, a night of being a dude's night, we were going to go to these giant mounds here in Tennessee that we, or these burial mounds that we believe are giant mounds. Mm-hmm. We should have scoped it out and scattered it out, because uh, we went at night, and we had to cross a river, so we weren't prepared for that, so we didn't do that. Uh, we did end up at the end of a, a very creepy road. We didn't actually get out there is what I'm trying to say, but we did, we did a night scouting trip, um, for the next mission. Right. But Nate shows up in a San Francisco giants sweatshirt <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> well, he just, he, he's letting everybody know we're playing for the home team. <laughs> yeah. So that's all to say, that's how nerdy we are at this point into this topic. We're not only are we interested in this, we're going out in the middle of the night and telling our wives, Hey, we're going to go to some giant mounds. If we don't come back, you know what happened? <laughs> Well, wearing a giant shirt probably helped you uh, to identify with them in case they're in, in case yeah. they were hostile. That's what I'm saying. If if they're mad, they'd be like they're the red beard. <laughs> yeah, they're like this guy's got red hair. Place for <laughs> place for the home team. I think we'll, we'll leave this guy alone. Yeah. Our last guest saw some floating orbs and lights and stuff. So we thought, I wonder if there's like any weird activity on those mounds at night because you can see them during the day. It's just a lump of you know, it's just a lump of dirt kinda. But at night, I'm sure there's some interesting stuff happens. So anyway, that's where we're at in the show. We've we're far down the rabbit hole. We want to learn more, so we're happy to have you on and keep diving. Thank you for inviting me. This is one of our favorite topics, but it's not necessarily a big mainstream topic. So, what got you specifically interested or into the Nephilim to the point where you end up writing writing on on giants, at least a couple pieces on on giants? Well, I've been interested in in biblical topics uh, for almost my entire life, and I'm 69, so been around the, the block a few times. My interest in the Nephilim specifically is related to, uh, well, it really was inspired, uh, and you mentioned that you've had Michael, uh, Dr. Michael Heiser on your show, and this, these two papers that I wrote were really inspired by a book that, that of his that we recently read. Well, I've got five kids, as I mentioned, and uh, we have a book club with our kids. They're all adults now, and so every Sunday night, we come over to our house for dinner, and uh, we read a book together and discuss it. And uh, one of the books happened to be The Unseen Realm, which is by Dr. Michael Heiser, which he perhaps mentioned on his show, on, the, on your show. And that's really what uh, inspired me to write these two articles. However, I had been interested in, in biblical topics for a long time. I've written a couple of novels myself, um, not about the Nephilim, but the novels are entitled Unholy Grail. Uh, the first one is the story of Judas Iscariot and Mary Magdalene. The second one is the heir of Judas Iscariot and Mary Magdalene, Unholy Grail. So I've written a lot on, on various religious topics, Christianity, and a lot of the articles, like I said, are, are, are like you had said, I put, were posted on academia. So my interest in the Nephilim is, is kind of long-term, but, but relatively recent in terms of, of my perked interest, I guess you could say. Well, I mean, I like your book club thing first. 
you know, Nate's grandma right now is reading Gary Wayne, and she's ninety six. So we like to bring that up. That uh, a book club is is <laughs> is, is fantastic. Right. Not many families could do that though. They read a book and not not get explosive with each other. Well, you know what I mean? Like, that's one of the things you, that 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 I think is important to develop, especially if you're going to be uh, uh, get get into a, a scholarly uh, examination of any topic, because you really have to have an open mind. You have to look at things from multiple perspectives. You have to be kind of a Democrat and a Republican and look at both sides of, or you know, all sides of the issue to evaluate not only your own position, but the position of others. And so that's what we attempt to do in our, in, with, our, with our own family. You know, developing the ability to disagree and, and discuss is a, is, is, a, mm. you know, is a good talent. Yeah, Dr. Heiser has been huge for me personally. I grew up in the church and grew up learning a lot of these topics. And it sounds like, you know, you a lot of people are the students of the Bible, mm-hmm. but for some reason this narrative is kind of hidden, and it's in plain view, but it's hidden. Why do you think that is, and and why do you think you connected the dots after that book specifically? Well, it's hidden because because the Genesis uh, six, which is where uh, the Nephilim are introduced, is very very brief. There is very little, almost no information about them at all. In the Genesis six topic, the pre-flood topic, of course, and I, and I suppose your listeners are pretty familiar with this because I, I, looking at your podcast history, uh, you have a, you've had a number of other podcasts on this subject. But Genesis six starts off by saying the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they decided to take whoever they they wanted as wives, and they they basically had children, and their children were the Nephilim, they were the mighty men of old, and that's it. So, so from the biblical perspective, you have relatively very, very little information. Now, it does go on to say in the next verse that evil was endemic and that God regretted that he made man on the earth. And so the connection between the Nephilim and the evil is there, but it's only implied. It's not direct. It's not directly stated. Uh, I don't think a lot of people have made that connection. I think that's why it's uh, relatively uh, um, obscure. In, in the paper, you, you, you reference um, the extra biblical writings from the Second Temple period. Correct. Talk a little about those and, and why, why you reference them and then also the credibility there. Because I think that's one of the things that really comes into play here. And we talked about Enoch in a few of our episodes. There's a lot of, you know, pre-Dead Sea Scrolls, there was a lot of yes, you know, a lot of pushback. But there still seems to be some push. Like people don't want to include it on a level. Obviously, it's not canonized. We can't, we're not going to do the Council of Nicaea all over again. Right. But you know, talk a bit about that, of Jasher Giants, Enoch, the credibility there, and I think maybe why that was so important in your work in, in backing up. Because like you said, Genesis 6 is so brief. Right. The, there are really three sources outside the Bible that discuss the Nephilim and the events of Genesis 6, you know, the sons of God, etc., in much greater detail. Probably the largest one is the, is, the, is the first book of Enoch, and there's several books of Enoch. The first book of Enoch is also called the Book of Watchers, and it was probably the first one written. Uh, there's also the Book of Jasher, which, by the way, is, is referred to in the Bible and other places, although it's not clear if the reference relates to the same book that, that we have now. And there's also um, a, a, a book called the Book of Giants, which is very, very fragmentary, which we don't have very much uh, detail on. All of these came from some at some point during the, what's, what you refer to as the Second Temple Period. And the Second Temple Period was from 500 uh, BC to around 200 BC. Uh, by the way, that was also the time uh, just before then when the Septuagint version was written of the, of the Bible, the translation from Hebrew, the first translation from the Hebrew into the Greek, that took place around 300 BC. So there's been a lot of debate on on what, if any, the sources were that the Second Temple authors used to, to write the books of Enoch and the book of Jasher and the book of Giants, and who exactly wrote them? Uh, we don't know who the authors were. We presume that the book of Watchers was probably from between 500 and 400, maybe 300 BC. Uh, other books of Enoch came later. So that gives you the time period. Now, it's possible that those people had uh, records going back further, I refer to in, in my in my document in the paper that you we're discussing here, the fact that that there are writings way back from from 2500 BC or so from ancient Mesopotamia that were actually uh, essentially spells or or enchantments or cleansing rituals. Uh, I, you could call them ancient exorcism rituals that were used to try and get rid of demons. And it's possible that 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 some of these were were some of the sources that the 
a second temple author is used. And it's also true that, that some of the books of the Bible, and particularly the book of Jude, and also, but also Second Peter, one of the one of the chapters in Second Peter has a lot of references. In fact, Jude quotes the book of Enoch almost directly. So the Second Temple period writings, the, the book of Enoch and so forth, were, was apparently well known to the gospel authors, at least to Jude anyway. Hmm. Maybe that's what the Beatles were singing about, right? <laughs> hey, Jude. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Jude. He, he knew something that we didn't maybe, know. He, maybe they he's, did. <laughs> he's got jokes. He's got jokes. <laughs> Sorry. I got dad jokes for days. So uh, here, here's a question. You know, as this stuff comes up, I mean, Luke and I kind of feel like, you know, once you get this red pill, so to speak, that's kind of the modern term for her. Right understanding this way of reading scripture, you can't go back. Exactly. Like you, you can't see it the same ever again. Is that like, is your family coming to an agreement about that? Because I still think there's a lot of academics, Christians who have like a, a Darwinism, what's the word where you, you combine evolution, theistic evolution or something like yeah, that? Yeah, theistic evolution. That. This kind of blows all that away from, from for me. Is that sort of been adopted by your family? Like you guys, you read Unseen Realm and then you kind of can't come back. You're just down the rabbit hole and you see everything differently. Well, from the if you're talking about the evolution perspective, uh, the theistic evolution was an invention of the Jesuit uh, Tillyard de Chardin. I, I've heard, I've rejected that a long time ago. I thought Tillyard Tillyard, by the way, was possibly one of the guys who he was involved with the Piltdown Man fraud, uh, and it's possible he participated in that, although we don't know for sure. Uh, but he was one of the guys who was associated with that Piltdown Man uh, episode. As, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, my, my, my Bachelor of Science degree is in biology. When I was studying biology, I got heavy into evolution. And frankly, it didn't make sense to me. The more I looked into it, the more I, 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 I could not understand how people could, could continue to treat it as a serious scientific subject. So I have written another, uh, in fact, probably it's my longest paper on, on academia.edu which is the Darwinian, Darwinian Emperor's Naked, Darwinism in Distress. You know, this is basically a critique of Darwinism. But, you know, the academic community, a lot of it is wedded to, to, to Darwinian thinking and to anti-biblical thinking, of course, which is part of it because the Bible is creationist, you know, of course, totally out of tune with a humanistic worldview. So uh, if that's your worldview and you basically need to support that, and if you think of all of the institutions that, that are committed to a Darwinian way of thinking. Think of like the like the Museum of Science in Boston, or any other museum. You know, the, these guys have PhDs. There's no way they're ever going to go back and say that it was wrong. They made a mistake. Can't happen. So they have to continually float their ideas and defend their ideas because they, there's no going back to that. Mm. Do you think? Do you think they have a lot of blind spots naturally because of that? Just you know, they can't see certain things that perhaps people outside of academia can see? Oh, well, possibly. If you're going to be a serious scholar, you really have to keep an open mind and you really have to evaluate and say, are, are my ideas correct? Is what I'm thinking, does it make sense? Does it, is it, so you constantly have to, have to do all this fact checking. And then what's nice about it, about publishing articles like this, is you get feedback from people and they will read your article and they'll say, well, what about this? Or what about that? You didn't think about this. And you'll say, well, damn, you're right. I didn't think about that. Hmm. <laughs> uh, and maybe I got to rethink it. Yeah. Or maybe maybe it was wrong, or maybe it's not necessarily wrong, but maybe I need to, 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 to rethink it. In fact, that recently happened to me on this whole issue of Ham's wife thing. We can get into that later. I'll, I'll tell you about that. Okay. Just so we don't get ahead of ourselves, Luke, uh, too much. And th this will be my next question, kind of lead into it. But my mind started to open up when I started re listening to stories about Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I grew up in the church and I couldn't make sense of it. Like, how does this creature fit into this? And then I started listening to Heiser and I was like, well, okay, if giants existed, I already I already believe there's this creature in the woods. So it's not hard for me to then believe these giants were rolling around in the woods and, you know, killing and eating people, basically just terrible beings. So do you have any thoughts on Bigfoot? We ask every guest that. That's sort of a tradition, but we kind of, you know, hopped into the more of the academic stuff. But have you looked into that topic at all? Do you think it fits into this story? Is it related to the Nephilim? Like, what are your thoughts about Bigfoot? You might not have any. I'm just just throwing it out there. Uh, well, Bigfoot is not an area that I've gotten into uh, in any depth. So, you know, my thoughts here are, are not at all. It would be just like the guy in the street. 
it, it, there is possibly a relationship to 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 to, um, to the Nephilim. It is possible that that the Nephilim genetics have been passed on, and that some people have have had them all, all the way down to today. Uh, that's also true of of what we'll probably talk, talk about later, which is psychopathology, which is some of the psychological aspects of, of the Nephilim. But mm. but here's a caution th- that I've seen. I have not yet uh, seen uh, any any clear indication that of archaeological discoveries of giant human fossils. Now, there recently was something in Ecuador where they have like the cave of giants. And when they've done excavations in, in, in uh, Bashan, uh, the area that where the presumably where the sons of God first uh, came down to earth, there, there are also very, very large houses there with big doors and stuff like that. But I have not yet seen any conclusive evidence of, of actual archaeological finds of giant human humanoid bones. Do you think that there's a – and then you can, you can land in all kinds of camps here. But a lot of people will say there's a, there's a cover-up or there's an effort – to suppress this and, and that, you know, early 1900s, we were seeing articles of this stuff being, you know, dug up all over the place and the bones have disappeared or, you know, that there's a lot of, a lot of questions. Right. No, there is. And there has been conspiracy theories. Cover-ups are possible. If you look at the Darwin's discovery of, of hominid fossils, for example, the, 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 one of the original discoverers of the Java man, if you've ever read about him, uh, his, the, the guy who discovered his name was Dubois. Uh, he, he hid the fossil for a long time because he didn't want to have anybody fully examine it because he wanted to be, be claimed as the guy who, who had first discovered the evolutionary link. Hmm. He called it uh, Australopithecus. He was the guy that, that coined that term, if you're familiar with it, from uh, paleontology. You know, it, it is possible that there were, uh, there were cover-ups. That, that, that's possible. On the other hand, Archaeology has only dug up what it's dug up, dug up. We don't know what we don't know. And there's so many places that have not yet fully been explored and dug up. And, and a lot of people nowadays, uh, a lot of biblical archaeologists that could be typified by guys like Israel Finkelstein, uh, Deaver, other archaeologists, they reject anything biblical that they can't show has an archaeological foundation. Hmm. And to me, that that is just, that's silly because archaeology we don't know what we don't know yeah well what we've interviewed uh, Brian Forster and LA Marzuli and they you know they've been out in Peru and they've they've put their hands on these elongated skulls right. do you think the elongated do you think the you think that's proof of the giants possibly I, and I, yeah. I, like, I, like I said I was just reading about this this uh, giant cave in Ecuador yeah. uh, and I haven't I haven't seen any any information about any hominid fossils that were discovered or bones or skulls or whatever but it you know yeah. that, that's possible. Brian told a weird story about how he was getting it tested in L.A. and he was sending the Paracas DNA, you know, of these people to L.A. and the, and they stopped it. They told him you're not allowed to to, to do any more testing here really? because they were finding out that they weren't human. And so this conspiracy theory seems to be spread all over the place. Either they hide the bones, the bones were dug up. There, the Smithsonian shows up almost eighty percent of the time on this on the scene of the crime in the newspapers. We brought on a guy that curates all the newspapers, our buddy Travis. Mm-hmm. So we've been on the hunt, and we interviewed uh, Luke Roger, who was a guy in Minnesota who dug up the bones in his backyard. He calls the local authorities. He says there was a 10-footer in his backyard, and he has a serpent mound on his property. Mm-hmm. He sees these bones. He says they were they were giant. He calls in the authorities, and guess what? They put a kibosh on digging. You can't dig there anymore, and they start, you know, they come around his house. They do flyovers, and they told him there's nothing to see here. So... Mm-hmm. It's it, it feels like every time you get close to these bones, there's somebody who says, nope, yeah, and, you can't talk I, about I, that. I, I wouldn't doubt that, that, that there could be, and, and the Smithsonian, you know, is very heavily Darwinistic and, and, and establishment. So it wouldn't surprise me that, that if it turned out that that was true. On mm. the other hand, we, we do have to be careful, like I said before, that, that that we're not dealing with uh, with with a real conspiracy theory. We we have to make sure that we have our evidence straight. Rich, does, does the lack of bones does that affect your belief in, no. in Genesis six no. giants at all? No. We laid laid the foundation there with Enoch and Jasher, and um, right. but really we want to talk to you about the psychopathology. So you came to this conclusion. Your paper is about the Nephilim. 
you know, basically that they were psychopaths. So talk, can, walk us through that. How you how you got there? Your your thoughts on that? And yeah, walk us through that. Then I want to figure out if, if if we're seeing things today that we're because of that. Right. Well, the the conclusion about the Nephilim being uh, psychopaths or psychopathic, uh, of course, is not is a conjecture. Right. I have to say this. There's no certainty here. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a reasonable conjecture. And that's that's the point of the article that I wrote. First of all, we have to we have to identify who the sons of God were without going into a lot of detail on all the different theories. This is a huge scholarly dispute. Uh, and, and perhaps Michael Heiser and others have alluded to it in past shows. But basically, uh, some people feel that they were divinized men or the sons of Cain or the sons of Seth or, or somebody other, some other things. However, I don't think any of those explanations has really holds any water. I think that the sons of God really have to be angelic or demonic spirit beings of some sort. I was say like you make you make a point there. I think that in the in your paper that's very interesting. I think I, just to, to you say that like if it would have been the sons of Cain or the sons of Seth, you feel like the Bible would have explicitly have said that. So there there isn't, isn't a space for conjecture, right? This is are you saying these are the the, the watchers? We're talking about like the watchers from yeah. Enoch and the sons of God being analogous, right? We're just talking about semantics. Yeah, the the, the book of of Enoch calls them the watchers. So the sons of God and the watchers are two terms for the same same group of, of, of people or, or spirits or whatever they were. And they're, they're actually named in the book of Enoch. Enoch actually comes out and names a number of them. According to Enoch, there were 200 of them. And they were led by uh, Shemiaza. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And they descended on Mount Hermon into the country of what's now the country of Bashan. It says that these sons of God, uh, assuming that they were angels, they then mated with or, or, or picked whoever they want to and probably raped women that they, that they were attracted to. Now, this presumes, of course, that angels or demons uh, can procreate, that they had that they were physical and they could copulate with these women. Of course, we don't really know from the Bible. The Bible doesn't really explain the nature of, of demons and, and angels and whether they can assume uh, physical nature. Uh, now it talks about Abraham, for example, meeting with angels and, and they ate together and so forth. But uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a step beyond this. They made it with the, the daughters of men and uh, produced the race that was called the Nephilim. And by the way, the word Nephilim uh, in Hebrew uh, probably means fallen in the sense of become evil, okay? Hence the, that term. Now, if the sons of God mated with, the, with women, they would have passed their genetic payload into these Nephilim. And according to the book of Enoch, the, the Nephilim were hybrids. They were part man or part human and part angelic or part demonic, part spirit being. The question is, what did that demonic payload of genetics produce in the Nephilim? And if you consider the character of what Satan is like, Satan is, is the ultimate psychopath. So uh, in my paper, I identified the, the characteristics of what, of what a psychopath is like. Uh, here, here are some of the characteristics of what a, what a, a typical psychopath is like. Uh, they, they have a superficial charm combined with the use of mind games. There's an absence of nervousness, a little concern for public, for personal safety, substance abuse, extreme selfishness, no respect for law or custom, continual deception, deviousness, and cunning, unrelented, co unrelenting condes uh, co uh, condescension and threatening behavior, overly controlling and sexually obsessive, guiltlessness, lack of conscience and refusal to take responsibility, rapid mood shifts, especially when the individual is unable to win or get their way, a twisted view of reality, and a total lack of empathy. So these are the characteristics uh, that the psychologists have identified as being true of psychopaths. Now, uh, psychopaths exhibit a range of, of behavior. It isn't, not all, not all psychopaths are necessarily serial killers and extremely dangerous to society. And there's also a difference between the way uh, uh, psychopathology is manifested in women versus men. In women, it tends to be more, they tend to get more depressed as opposed to being violent and, and, uh, and controlling and sexually obsessive. But nevertheless, in the extreme cases, this is what they're like. Uh, and they've done psychological tests uh, on, on prisoners that, are, that have been identified as, as, as psychopaths, 
and they find out that there are certain brain regions, regions in the brain, I won't go into all the, the technical details of what the brain regions were, but you could read about that from my paper. Certain re regions of the brain that are either overly enlarged or un unenlarged or, or, or like minimal, where uh, psychopaths differ in their brain structure and their functioning between other people. So when, when images of, of, of people in pain is, is played to them, rather than, than, than having them become sorry for the people or feeling empathy, instead they feel pleasure. Mm. So they've actually done testings of the brain of, brains of these people. So this is the nature of, 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 of people that, that, are, that are psychopaths. Now the question is, you know, where did this come from? We know that, that, that they know that furthermore that, that psychopathology is heritable because they've observed that kids and grandkids of parents that were that were psychopaths also exhibit similar can exhibit similar functions. And of course, we don't know what what exactly what the genetic carriers are, what, what genes are related to this, and exactly how all this brain function works. And furthermore, we we can't really extend any 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 historical study backwards in time, because uh, the study of psych psychopathology is very very recent. Uh, and like it, any study of mental illness is, is recent. And so we don't really, we can't really go back at, at all in history to look at where this all came from. But, but yeah. to me, uh, psychopathology and satanic actions are essentially the same. Yeah, so it, it kind of turns into a sort of a philosophical debate of everyone has a degree of that in them. But when it becomes like what is considered a psychopath is when it's just like, you know, like 90, 99% of the time you're that way. Or as a kid, we all went through those stages where we were, we were all those things. It's an interesting conversation of like how much deems you a psychopath, right? Right. Uh, you know, sin is essentially genetic. It says that we're all sinners, right? right. And, and, we, right. and we all know when we have kids, you know, I never teach the kid to do wrong. The kid does wrong all by themselves. You have to teach him to do right. So uh, we know that, that sin is, is a characteristic of all people. Uh, but some people, of course, go off the rails. Uh, and uh, psychologists have two terms for this. That, that, that they call this a psychopath or sometimes they call it a sociopath. But it's essentially a division of the, of the same disease or the same mental condition where a sociopath is just a more gentle version of a psychopath, I guess you could say. A more self-realized version, right? Yeah, a sociopath is someone who abuses his own family, whereas, whereas a psychopath is like a serial killer and goes after strangers. So then are we, are we looking at what the Bible said about the giants and what we know about the giants from the biblical account and saying that those characteristics seem to line up with psychopathy? Well, yeah, and then, then if, you, if, you, if you put together not only what it says that, that the what the origin of the Nephilim was, but also their, their effect on, on the society of that time. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that you live at a time in small villages and you're surrounded by tribes of very large, very uh, aggressive macho guys who uh, are, are sexually obsessive and, and don't care about you at all. I mean, that must have been a terrifying time to live. Absolutely. It's like giant serial killers running around. That right. Are, yeah. That are, that are, I mean, they talk, in the Bible, I believe, Nate, we've talked about this before. They, the giants were like known for bloodlust. Like they had this insatiable, not only that, but then they were known to eat, you know, humans. Yes. Allegedly. Well, not only that, but I mean, we, you know, we talked about on the show several times that, I mean, these Israelites were commanded to kill every last one of them. So, I mean, <laughs> It wasn't like there was anything worth saving, it sounds like, right? Well, and that's yeah, a big contention for a lot of people's faith, right? They don't understand that part of the Bible. And when you plug in this uh, idea that maybe they were all psychopaths, then it makes sense. And right? they, were, they were hybrid humans. They weren't human necessarily yeah, either, right? In fact, you could see it as an act of mercy rather than an act of, of, of rage or anger on the part of God. Yeah. But, I mean, this that what you just said assumes that, that, that the Nephilim actually— uh, they're, they're either they reappeared after the flood or their genetics reappeared in people, um, which is that the subject, like I said, of my second paper. That's another mm -hmm. level of speculation, by the way. Right. And some people disagree with that. But I mean, you, you got to imagine, right? You have this this hybrid giant hybrid race that's running around and their whole M.O. is bloodlust, rape, violence, 
you know, on a degree that we, that we maybe we can conject that, you know, it's like a bunch of giant Ted Bundy and, you know, all these different serial killers. I can't even think of any right now because, you know, all I do is watch true crime though, Nate. I'm disappointing myself right now. Yeah, but it's even worse yeah. than that because they're not, they're not simply individual killers. They're groups of them. Hmm. Tribes of them. Yeah, like a gang, you know. And like exactly, like a gang. Uh, if you've ever played World of Warcraft, uh, picture a, a huge gang of guys that all come at you at the same time. I mean, there's no way you defend yourself. You're immediately killed. And we've seen that in, in human psychology where, like, groups of people will get together and when, like, you know, the mob mentality, right? And they'll do things they wouldn't do if they were by themselves. Right. And that brings up a lot of a, a lot of questions that you know we talk about all the time on the show. Is you had human beings amongst these things. The human beings couldn't survive. They couldn't flourish. They couldn't reproduce. They couldn't even grow crops. It sounds like because these things would come in and kill them. I mean, how do they even? They must have just been hiding all the time in constant stress, just trying to survive these things. Right, and and of course we don't really have any records of this pre-Diluvian society, and the Bible doesn't tell us about it. Uh, the, the the Bible simply limits its its phrases to what happens after Ge- in Genesis six verse five and following, where it talks about the evil of society grew so great that God regretted that He had even created people. And so once you start thinking about the consequences of run amok groups that were fathered by demons, the impact of that on, on the world, then you can start understanding why. God brought the flood. Yeah. So then that brings us to the next point then. If we're, if we're to to buy the notion that psychopathology is heritable, um, then that means it would have been passed on um, because we do have the reemergence of the Nephilim and the Rephaim post-flood. Yeah, but let, let me caution you here. Yeah. There is only one other reference in the Bible to the word Nephilim, and that's in Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 13. And uh, this is the story of the spies that Joshua sends out to spy out the land, land of Israel, and, or rather not Joshua, Moses sent them out. Joshua was the leader. Uh, Joshua and Caleb were in that group, and then there were 12 of them. And, of course, if you remember the story, they, they the spies come back. They said the land is really co- good and cool. We want to go in and, 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 and deal with this. But the people there are huge. We, we, we seem like grasshoppers in comparison to them. Yeah. What's interesting mm-hmm. is that Caleb and Joshua, two members of the, of the group, did not challenge what the other 10 had said. They didn't say, no, 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 these guys are, are, are they're the same size as us. Rather, they said, no, we can take them. OK, so, so in other words, they agreed with the assessment of the 10, but the 10 doubted that, that, that they had enough power and, and stature to be able to deal with the with these large inhabitants large and militant inhabitants. And it talks about the fact that there were the sons of Anak, the Anakim there. And, but, you know, we don't know, uh, or rather I should say that the spies didn't know what the Nephilim looked like. They would have no idea uh, if the people that they saw were these these pre-Diluvian uh, giants that Genesis 6 talks about. Right. They, they, yeah. There was no point of reference, right, after the flood. Exactly. And they were so wiped they're out. assuming that they are. So some people have said, well, these guys were, 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 were big and they were tough, but they weren't necessarily Nephilim. My thinking is that, that it goes on to talk about the size of Goliath, for example. The regular Bible tells that the, the, the Goliath was six cubits in a span, which is in a cubit. There's different dimensions of the cubit, but the smallest dimension is 18 inches. And the span is the length of a man's hand. So that means that, 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 that Goliath was about nine and a half feet tall. It's a big boy. Now, other, other translations say that he was four, in, four cubits in a span, which would be six and a half feet tall, but still pretty large because the Israeli men of that time, it's generally thought that they were about five feet tall. Yeah, yeah. I've heard about that, like the royal cubit's different than the regular. Yeah, and, and, and of course, some... the royal cubit is actually it's 24 inches. Okay, it's even longer. And technically, and yeah, I've heard people say it would have been royal cubits, so that's how he would have known. Possibly. And then there's also the issue, let's say, of Og's bed. Og was supposedly of the Rephaim. Rephaim is, is, is thought to be another word that, that means the same thing as Nephilim. Rephaim, the, the word means the, the dead ones. The Og the, the, was the king of Bashan and uh, had this large bed that was, um, I forget the exact dimensions, but it was like 18 feet long, you know, and nine feet it's a, wide. It's a big bed. Uh, yeah. And of course, he probably had a good time having orgies on his bed there, but 
off. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of women, maybe. So we, we still have giant, you know, at this point in the Bible, we still have giant humans or giant people or giant beings. I mean, you wrote you wrote on this. Do you believe it was a, I mean, there's the second incursion camp, and then there's the that one of the wives of Noah's sons carried, you know, carried the genetic code. I had likewise puzzled over this. Were these, were these large people of the Anakim and the other races and then Goliath and so forth and Goliath's brothers and other, other guys that, that King David fought later, were they actually Nephilim? And so then uh, I suddenly, uh, I started thinking about the genetic aspects of this. And I, I started looking in, into back into, into, into the history of Noah. And you remember Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then uh, after they come out of the ark, there is this kind of strange story, I think it's Genesis 9, of, of family problems where they plant this vineyard, harvest grapes, and they make wine, and Noah gets drunk, and he, ex- he quote-unquote, exposes himself in the tent. Then his son Ham supposedly sees this, but doesn't do anything, but Shem and, 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 and Japheth cover him up. In the aftermath of this, what's, here's what's curious. It says, the the text of the scripture is, it says that Noah, when he awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. In other words, something was done. It was not just seen. Ah. And who is his youngest son? If we take Shem, Ham, and Japheth, if that's the order of birth, uh, Japheth would have been the youngest son. But the Bible often uses the term son uh, as descendant, okay? So it could be a grandson, it could be a great-grandson. Uh, his youngest son at that point, therefore, may have been Canaan. And Canaan was the son, one of Ham's sons, okay? And then, ironically, Noah doesn't curse Ham. He curses Canaan with a double curse. He says, Canaan, he says, Canaan you're going to be the slave of, of Shem, and furthermore, you're going to be the slave of Japheth. So what it appears to me is that, that seeing the nakedness of your father, which was the, the euphemism there, was a euphemism that's in other, other parts of scripture used as uh, some sort of sexual act. So in my estimation, it was either a homosexual act done by Canaan to Noah or a heterosexual act done by Cain, uh, Canaan to Noah's wife. And that was, the, that was the cause of the curse. So once Canaan is cursed, then, of course, you know, you know, everything kind of falls apart from there. And if you, if you study, uh, Canaan, of course, is the eponymous father of all the tribes that inhabited the land of Canaan. Yeah. And if you study the land of Canaan, you find out that they, uh, the land of Canaan had the most aberrant sexual practices of any society of its time. They were probably the ones that invented sacred, pro- uh, sacred prostitution, where uh, in order to ensure fertility for your crops— you had to have sex with a temple goddess uh, or you had to have a young girl and they'd either do the sex in the temple or they do it on what they called high places. Uh, you know, the Bible refers many times to in the old Testament to these high places or in groves of trees. And they had these, what they called Asherah poles. Uh, you could think of them as pole dancing. So they were probably phallic symbols, uh, which represented sex uh, to, to in, in the form, in the form that was done to, pacify the gods so your land would be would would be would have rain and would grow and of course they were the ones that and and and, you know that joshua when he came in he was he was told to wipe out certain tribes entirely yeah and they were the ones that were the the nephilim related or thought to be the nephilim related tribes it seems like there's this theme from the beginning of the bible till the weird stories of today where people are being abducted forced into sexual weird situations some uh, obsession with reproduction, genetics, DNA. Mm-hmm. I mean, it goes all the way back to the dawn of time, but it's still happening very much today. Right. And a lot of people have terrifying experiences with these things, messing with them even to this day. So is that all related to the days of Noah? And it seems like we talk a lot about this too, that these beings are often found underground, big black eyes, smell terrible. Is it possible that some of them just went underground and can survive and they come back out and there's not as many of them, but there's still a few lingering? Was it as simple as that? Well, you know, I, I really can't speculate. I, I'm not an expert in that area. I can't speculate on whether they went underground and whether they, you know, to what extent they survived today. But I have done a fair amount of reading 
on UFOs and uh, alien abductions. And this is my opinion. Uh, my opinion is that UFOs and alien, ab alien abductions are demonic. And they are essentially, this whole transhumanism movement is essentially a replay of the ancient hybridization done by the sons of God. And the sons of God, if you look back in the book of Enoch, it was more than simply hybridization. They, they brought in all kinds of demonic practices. They're the ones that invented, uh, helped invent astrology. They are the ones that, that invented or that helped humans invent sorcery and other, other magical practices, uh, you know, mediums and stuff that, that you know, where we, we have Ouija boards and things like that, that to bring on Satan and bring on evil spirit, bring on spirits, basically came from the knowledge that was imparted via these, these sons of God to people. And one of the things we talk about on our show, Rich, is that the uptick in creature sightings that we're, that we're seeing, and I know that one of the things that, that you covered as well in, in one of those papers is that we talk about the the cryptids right there's this the idea that that the genetic experiments didn't end with humans or we can assume or we can conject that there was also genetic experiments going on in the days of noah with animals and then we have a lot of our mythological creatures pan and right. and centaurs and minotaurs and all these the egyptian stuff with horus and the heads of animals on right. the bodies of people that that it's not just a bunch of myth mythology and, and legend and, and imagination that they're more than likely we can assume or at least we can have an opinion that stuff might have happened. Right. And there's a the people that have studied mythology will tell you whenever you get to a myth, there's a lot of it that's probably error or made up, imagined, but there's a core of reality behind it. So my thinking about the core of reality behind uh like you know, for example, we talked about um <clears throat> Pan, the goat man, you mentioned him, yeah. uh the centaur, the horse mm -hmm. man. Uh, the ancient Egyptians had guys like Horus with a hawk head, uh, Sobek, a crocodile god. And that when you're going to personify the god, you'd put on a head of a crocodile, the head of the hawk. Book of Enoch goes into detail about the fact of, of the, these sons of God making these kind of biological weirdos, weird, weird, weird creatures, knowing that, that this is not what God wanted. It was basically an anti-god thing. And to make these things up, and that's where that's where these legends came from. Well, Jasher talks about it, right? Yeah, Book of Jasher, as well as the Book of the a Book of Watchers in Enoch. Yeah, they say that the uh, sons of men took the cattle of earth, the beasts of the field, fowls of the fowl of the air, and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other, right? In order therewith to provoke the Lord. I also I also quote there's a there's an there's an Egyptian uh, historian, Manetho or Manetho, who discusses this. And I quote that in one of the papers. It was interesting too, is that we've touched on it briefly, not really talked about it a ton, but the explosion of technology and in, in, in once these sons of God came down and the, the, the idea that there's, you know, you have, there's the whole ancient alien theory now, which, which has really taken off. And we talked to Heiser a bit about this it really taken off in the last, you know, since the 1900s or so. Mm -hmm. But really, do you think that a lot of this was these, sons of God living as God kings once they, once they had rebelled from heaven? Well, if, if these sons of God did these biological experiments and created horsemen or, or goat men or whatever, and other, other forms of, of weird combinations of animals, we have to think that they probably died in the flood. So the question is, how, how did, if, if Horus was, for example, was an actual hawk man after the flood, how could that have happened? My feeling is that, that, that this did not happen again after the flood, but rather the ideas were, were represented to themselves. Uh, by the way, Horus was the, was the, uh, the son of, of, supposedly the son of Osiris and Isis, and all the pharaohs attributed their lineage to Horus, okay? Hmm. To me, uh, the, after the flood, you don't have the same miscegenation that you had prior to the flood. That didn't happen. But nevertheless, people had the ideas planted, already planted in their head. And they basically used these ideas in, 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 in the worship of gods. Now, other people have different thoughts, but that's my thought. So more of like a collective memory. Yeah. Like where, there, where we knew that, you know, as humans, we had this oral, oral memory, oral tradition of these things that happened before the great cataclysm. Right. But then the question is, now, getting down to today and, and the UFO explosion, by the way, I just saw an article that, that the U.S. government is going to come out with a, a, a document 
that's going to reveal everything that the government knows about Roswell and, and, and a lot of other stuff. And we'll see it when that happens. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of, of doing a screenplay uh, on this subject. Hmm. But let me explain it a little bit more in detail. Yeah. My feeling is that we're that Satan is basically setting up for a replay of what happened back in, in the days of Noah, as you will, as you indicated. P- people are being abducted. And this, th- there's been a lot of studies that show this. There's an interesting book. I don't know if I've, if I've referenced it, and I don't recall the name of it. I can find it uh, and tell your listeners. But uh, a good book on this by a guy who's, who's done uh, examinations of, of, of people that, that have been supposedly abducted by aliens. The aliens have done biological experiments on them, and particularly women. They've they've been impregnated with fetuses. They're not sure exactly what the source of the sperm is. The women are are get pregnancy tests. They're, they find them pregnant. Sometime later, they find out that they're not pregnant, mm. and they they have been repeatedly abducted, and the mm. fetus has apparently been taken out. Uh, women have been encouraged to hold these weird kind of baby aliens. Guys have been have been abducted, less so than women, and their sperm has been taken and possibly modified or genetically modified somehow. We don't, of course, we don't know. This may be a setup for what what we have in in, in the book of Revelation for the invasion of the locusts, for the invasion of the locusts. So the question is, are, are UFOs and all this other stuff, are they actually, is it possible that there's another society out there somewhere else in, in the universe? This is another subject that's very interesting, astrobiology and astrophysics. I would highly recommend to your audience that they read the book, The Privileged Planet by Guillermo Gonzalez and Jay Richards. This book lays out the fact that it's very, very, very unlikely that there's any other planet anywhere in the cosmos uh, that has the conditions will, that would enable life to, like ours to, to prosper and develop right. human life. And so that being the case, and, and of course, you, you guys pro- are, are, pro- are no doubt familiar with SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, which has been going on for like 60 years now, which are these big dishes aimed to all parts of the sky, trying to find radio signals. And what they found is nothing. Hmm. And the UFOs are not, there's no evidence that these UFOs are, are extraterrestrial. Right. They're supposedly sur- somehow in the, in the ambit of, of Earth's atmosphere. So where do they come from? Are they on the backside of the moon? Are they landing on Mars? Are they landing on Venus or Mercury? Where, are they, where would they be? So to me, the logical explanation here is that the, these UFOs are demonic and they're carriers of these basically these baby factories that are being used to create a hybrid army. Some people say this other, they, they come out from underground. Possibly. Uh, yeah. They just fly. They seem come go right into mountains and come out of mountains. Possibly. And other weird stuff. And you know, those listening right now, I think, you know, we touched on this in the beginning of the episode. Even if we don't have giant bones, there are so many weird stories in the Bible, which are not, I wouldn't say I use the word weird anymore. I just think I used to think they were weird, like the writing on the wall or talking animals or the dead coming out of the tombs and walking around after the resurrection. You just skip over that on Easter. We're like, whatever. All these dead guys came out. Think of it this way. If God created the world and if Jesus rose from the dead, how hard are any of these other things to happen? Well, sure, sure. But I think a lot of people just get, they've been so infected by rationalism. They skip over these stories. Mm Mm-hmm. The, the Giants isn't any more odd than any other thing in the Old Testament or several things in the New Testament. So this isn't, to a lot of people, this is like w- really strange stuff, but we can't read the stories and they're right in front of us. They almost jump out of the page. If it was a snake, we'd be dead. You know, we're, we're just like, give us the bones, give us the giant bones. You know, if we if I don't have a bone, I don't believe any of this stuff. Well, that's what the archaeologists say. Yeah, that's what Finkelstein yeah. says. But but th- th- think of it this way, guys. Let's suppose the Nephilim were only six and a half feet tall. Let's suppose they weren't giants. They were still a six and a half foot guy 
to a guy that's five foot tall, still looks like a giant, and they can still be massive uh, and have an incredible physique and, uh, and do a lot of damage, even if they're not nine feet or 10 feet or 17 feet tall. Yeah. Even if they're only six and a half or seven. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I I get nerdy in this stuff, and we have giant weapons. We've got giant footprints in stone. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got gi- carvings of these things being huge. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence, personally. I think there's m- more than enough. We, uh, we brought in a guest that has 2,000 articles of <laughs> newspapers from 100 years that these things are d- being dug up. Right. So to me, it's 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 almost like it feels like your demonic theory with the UFOs. I think Satan himself is kind of sweeping up all the evidence of himself until – the right time, right? Like, does you know he didn't want people to think about this stuff until it's too late, right? Till they're trapped on Pleasure Island, and then he's got them. Let me give you one other scenario for this to happen. The issue uh, of the doctrine of the rapture is very controversial, and many Christians don't agree with it. Uh, it talks about possibly allusions to the rapture are in First Corinthians fifteen, for example. If that is true, that that's going to happen, then Perhaps what happens is that the demons are waiting until after that event to have this invasion of the hybrids, because at that point, there will be a lot more possibility for for worldwide confusion and less people to refute it. And so this is another interesting tidbit for you guys. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. Familiar with uh, Chris uh, Putnam and Tom Horn. Uh, They wrote a very interesting book, which I would highly recommend your, your listeners get. It's called Exo Vaticana. The, the Vatican right now has uh, one, the most advanced telescope, radio telescope in the world on the top of Mount Graham is in Arizona. Yeah, I've read about this. The purpose of this telescope is to look for ETs, look for ext- extraterrestrial or what they call exoplanets. Isn't it called like L- L- Lucifer? It's called Lucifer, <laughs> yeah. ironically. <laughs> what? The Vatican is funding this. Okay, the Catholic yeah. Church, uh, your, the parishioners of the Catholic Church are funding this, uh, and and so they're it's constantly looking. This is employed. This is part of the SETI thing. Uh, this is part of, part of all the money that's going. And by the way, all the space research nowadays is is almost entirely devoted to search for other populations, mm. extra extraterrestrial populations. This Vatican telescope is one example. Pope Francis is. Supporting this, of course, he is making, as you probably are aware, is, is making uh, ecumenical movements. He's already met with Muslim Muslim organizations in an attempt to bring uh, Catholicism in, in more closely with, with, uh, with Islam. And also he's met with the Dalai Lama. So there's this, this, this attempt to kind of commingle Christianity with Eastern religion, with Buddhism and so forth. I, I'm not an anti-Catholic at all, but uh, I have a lot of Catholic friends that are really good Christians. But to my mind, the Vatican has been long been a serious, serious problem. And I have another paper on 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 academia.org devoted to that, to looking at the criticism. It's called Criticism of the Church uh, mm-hmm. that talks about the history of, of the Vatican. So you supposedly have a bunch of crazy stuff in that library, too, that you can't really get your hands on. Right. Yeah. I mean. They steal the bones all the time that's, too. I've read. <laughs> they got to. I mean, they, they must be in the league with the Smithsonian. Those guys are stealing all the bones. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like you know we said this on the podcast before, like DNA wars, right? You have the you have the tale of two bloodlines f- fighting, and there's a lot of similarities in like they both want their gospel story to to win, right? Yes. Well, guess what? Isn't it crush the head of the serpent? Right. It's the whole right. And I'm sure you guys have noticed this that. Increasingly in, in America and all throughout the Western world, especially, the level of ability of other people that, that have different positions to, to, to accept other positions is decreasing. So we have a hardening of positions. Republicans and Democrats, which is probably the best example, uh, can't talk to each other anymore. They can't even look at each other. They can't even consider each other's views anymore. Mm-hmm. Oh, we get one stars or five stars. <laughs> exactly. That's all. That's all we exactly. get on our show. Exactly. Yeah. You get they the love it or hate love it. Mail, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's. We always joke about that. Yeah. It's it's the it's the dichotomy, the split. Right. Chris, do you think? Do you think this whole? Uh, I got to go back to this real quick. But do you think that the, that the psychopathy thing, right? So if do you, do you think that our, our our modern day like the serial killer phenomena? Do you think there there could be if you conject? Yes. A possibly I think a connection. That it's very possible that that, that 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 this can be related. 
but uh, I, you can't prove it or you can't right. really demonstrate right. it. Okay. Right. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, we all know that, that everybody has a sin nature and that, that even the best of us will do evil things or do bad things. It may be simply cheating on our income taxes or, um, you know, uh, stealing a carton of milk from the, from the grocery store, something like that may not be psychopathology, but nevertheless, uh, we'll lie, we'll deceive people, all that sort of stuff. Cheat Nate's, bi- Nate's big on stealing milk. You caught him there. That's a hard thing to steal, the jug of milk. But uh, <laughs> if you can steal a jug of milk, I, I tip my cap to you. That's pretty That's pretty hard. And poor Bigfoot's just sitting in the woods, and he and there's just this war going on. He just stays there. You know what I mean? What is? I, I just keep coming back to, you know, a lot of our listeners, they come here to listen to Bigfoot stories. And uh, then we blast him with these heavy theological um, threads. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, my theory on Bigfoot is it fits into the story where it's a remnant. It's like a remainder. Because we still hear stories of, of supposedly some of these giants still live in these caves mm-hmm. in, like, remote parts of the world. Well, let, 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 me, let, me, give like you, let me give you my, my, my just two, yeah. two, two yeah. cents on Bigfoot. Bigfoot is simply part of the... The detrius or the or the result of of all of this theological heavy theological stuff that we've been talking about yeah kind of the, the tail end of it like a chimera a goat man yes but not a chimera it, it, he may actually be real to, to really appreciate bigfoot you have to know more than just bigfoot or know more than whether there's bigfoot bones or whether he's living underground you have to dig farther back into history like we've done today uh, to, to talk about the, the antecedents to this. Yeah. And, that, and that's, I said, that's what we have explored over the past uh, time that we've been talking, been chatting. Yeah. And that's where we, we get, that's where we get the one stars from the Bigfoot people yeah. because they don't, they just want to hear the weird stories. <laughs> they don't want to, they don't want the answers, but we want to get the answer. <laughs> no, but it, it's all related, Nate. This is, this is yeah. like the point of the whole thing, right? Is that I think all these things are related. This has right. just made the Bible more a cohesive story. Oh, yeah. Where, from 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 the beginning to end, you have a problem. So, what do you see the future? I mean, that's the next question. Like, what's coming down the pipe? Is Bigfoot going to come out in the, <laughs> out of the woods and and f- join this end end times war? What what's coming? What I don't know. I mean, you got UFOs <laughs> flying around. How weird is it going to get, Rich? I mean, we we want to know. Well, uh, uh, we know. Uh, I'll tell you that there's one one symbol, one definite symbol that you can know that we're in the end times, mm. and that is that Israel came back in, in as a nation in 1948. So we know that that we are living in the end times. Now uh, I don't have any better answers than anybody else, and I'm sure if you ask that question to Michael Heiser or or. They're not going to have any good answers for you either because we don't know. Jesus says nobody knows the time, uh, the era that this is going to happen. But nevertheless, the signs are there. And here are the signs that we see. In addition to Israel coming back as a nation, you have increasing uh, storms, okay, uh, that we've seen across the planet. Many more hurricanes, uh, tidal waves, things like that. That's one of the signs of the end. We see there's an increase in peace and safety. Israel has made peace with with a lot of its Arab protagonists or Arab uh, antagonists, I should say. The UAE, now now possibly Saudi Arabia, the UAE, UAE Yemen, uh, and so Oman, uh, etc. So we may be entering that era where we have like quote unquote peace and safety. At the same time, we have a lot a lot of wars. We have this increasing culture war where people are getting uh, less and less able to even consider the opinions of anybody else, uh, to me, is a significant factor. Mm. We're, we're having a lot of UFO activity. It's so common that you never even hear about it anymore. I got a comedian buddy who jokes about it. Like, like 2020 was so so wild and crazy that like we had all these alien you know UFO reveals yeah. by the, by the right. government and didn't even blip yeah. on anyone's radar. It reminds, me of, it reminds me of a great Bigfoot meme I saw today, Luke. It was it was it was the car of Simpsons and everyone's got a scowl on their face, but Homer's smiling and it says when you just have to talk about Bigfoot but kill the conversation. So. <laughs> Rich, do you think uh, this is something that I've I've been throwing around for a while? Because every time we talk about aliens, I cringe a little bit, right? And it just is like <laughs> I just don't. But I think I think the worldview you bring 
my thought is this. Do you think that this whole thing is a conditioning to set up for, you know, a close encounter, like like an actual reveal where we have this alien encounter and that ushers in, I don't know, the, the you know, those the seven years of tribulation or do we have, is the Antichrist going to be, you know, this hybrid alien that says like, you know, I we this is all a big experiment. Is this, is this the great deception? Are we looking at like the conditioning or the, or the hastening? Mm-hmm for the great deception by this increase in all this activity. I believe so, yes. If you, if you read that book, Exo Vaticana, and you look at the statements that the, <clears throat> that the people from the Catholic Church are making, they're preparing us for alien invasion, uh, for our space brothers, who are going to come down, solve the problems of the world, uh, solve global warming. They will uh, eliminate racism. They will eliminate uh, patriarchy. They will eliminate free enterprise and socialize us, you know, which is, of course, what Bernie and, and Biden and company want to do and others of their um, of their crowd. Um, and, and so basically, at, one, at some point, uh, there will probably be uh, uh, the Space Brothers arriving. Now, whether or not this comes after or before the rapture or whether the rapture is associated with that, I think is an interesting concept, because if it comes afterwards, you have less, you have very, very few people who could refute it or who would want to refute it left. Right. So right. the potential for worldwide deception is very, very high. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we already, we already see the fight, you know, a lot of people, you know, you have two camps. People think that this mask is protecting you from this virus and other people are swear it's conditioning. You know, they're just conditioning you to, do what they say and either right. side can convince either side of either's point right right but um yeah it feels like we are you only listen to your buddies right yeah you don't listen to the other side just blurry yeah. creatures mostly <laughs> yeah we get weird so people can we're slowly trying to open people's minds to a lot of this stuff and to figure out you know we call Big, bigfoot the gateway drug because it sort of opens your mind to you know, a lot of people just like to stay there and they don't want to go back in time and ask themselves some harder questions of maybe the ancient world was crazier than I thought. And when you were just a minute ago, when you were saying about the future, someone said the days of Noah, when, when Jesus talked about the days of Noah returning, for lack of better words, the fourth dimension and the third dimension are going to be interacting again, right? right. So we sort of had this era of humanity where it's kind of just us right now. You know what I mean? It's been going on since after the flood, and then there was a little bit of left, and they washed it out, and then it's kind of just the age of humans, or to make it Lord of the Ringsy, the age of hobbits, or you know, and right. and now age of man, yeah, the age of man, and now we're kind of like, so you think our our brothers are coming out of the sky? It's going to be that amalgamation of spirit world and humans again, and they're gonna they're gonna sell it to us like it's a good thing. Absolutely, yeah. Of course, they'll sell it to you like it's a good thing. That's the only way they can sell it. Yeah, I mean, this is what Alberino calls the elder race, right? It's it's the it's the angelic race, and that they're, they're, yeah. this will be the. I've heard I don't know who was saying it, or we were talking about Nate, but it was the idea that this ra- the rapture would be rationalized by, oh look, we just the you know the aliens we just removed all of the racists and bigots and everybody else that you know that Tony said that yeah yeah it was Tony that's what they Tony said it. right but yeah, it's yeah. like this whole idea that like. Really, all you're going to erase is anybody who knows that the truth of what's going on, because all the white guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. Hey, I'm One star. I'm di- we are toast. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ginger. I'm different. <laughs> <laughs> One star. No, it's uh, fa- it's fascinating. I, I I think that like our your thoughts on on the UFO phenomena and my and Richard really, and I'm sure Nate. I don't speak for Nate, but really line up. I think that's. <laughs> That's where I land. It's the the idea that there's all these other there's there's people from other planets that just fly around and don't have any inter, really have interaction, but do kidnap people allegedly. But don't have. It's just it's a weird. It's really harder to believe that I think than than, than that we're having this interaction with you know with something demonic. And we always we we've talked about this a number of times. But God's omnipresent, but He's the only omnipresent being. And in order for other things to be other places, they have to travel just like anything else, just mm-hmm. like we do. Right. And, right. you know, we had this crazy story from, from Tony Merkel and from the confessionals podcast about, 
this craft that that they found that these special forces found and had you know had Anakian language in it and like this dead demonic language and I just think it all kind of starts to line up in 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 some ways and um there yeah. are people, people that hold on they want to hold on to the Bigfoot's a gigantopithecus and that aliens are really just you know these grays and little green men from other planets but just uh, the the deeper we get down the rabbit hole Nate the harder it is I find any of that to be credible yeah Rich I got I, well. Sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say I have I have like one one more question about that. Um, why the spacecrafts? Is this does this relate to like the weird megaliths that they build that they had this they had this technology that we don't quite understand? I mean, because some people just I think that's what throws them for a loop is they're still like flying machines. Like if they were in the demonic realm, why the machines? That's 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 the question that's hard a little harder to answer. What do you think about that? Well, I I'm not really sure about that. That may be part of the deception. You know, the Bible says all, 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 all over the time that Satan was a deceiver from the very beginning. And so this may be, may be an element, a necessary element of the whole UFO deception, that demons you have to use these craft uh, to get around, which I don't think they probably do. Could, could that be like in Ezekiel, the wheel within the wheel? Is there like... Right. Has this stuff been going on since day one? Like these these craft, maybe they have they've always been using them. Possibly, I mean, we can't really know. Uh, but uh, but the 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 whole uh, idea of ancient aliens. Number here's the here's the problem with ancient aliens. If if ancient aliens created us, who created them? Where did they come from? That's problem number one. Problem number two is like I was telling you before the the privileged planet problem. It's, it's virtually impossible to find any place in the universe where you could even have microbial life, any other planet. All the conditions, uh, I mean, you, have to, you, you have to get into this a little bit to, to appreciate this. There are so many interconnected systems in this planet, uh, in, the, in the geology of the planet, in the interior of the planet, in the atmosphere around us, in, in, the, in our animals, and in I mean, one one common example is the fact that that you need both trees and, and animals to, to to exist because the animals produce uh, carbon dioxide, which use are used by the trees, which in turn produce af- oxygen that the animals need and that we need. It's a symbiotic. So yeah. there are there are these in, these incredibly complex feedback systems. It's, it's virtually impossible that there's any other place in the in the entire cosmos that has these conditions. Yeah. So given that fact, the whole ancient alien stuff, it, it just isn't tenable. It's not reasonable. I, lo- uh, yeah. I love it. Yeah, Heiser says he's got thousands of documents that haven't been published that they could blow holes in it all. But, you know, it, mm-hmm. it's it's hard because we talked about that, that it's just got better marketing, right? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah Luke, and I, right. Luke and I came from the entertainment industry. We understand marketing. You know, in some ways you can polish a turd and put it out there and – <laughs> and people will buy it. It's like, oh, that's weird. But here's the thing. My thought is it's because the church doesn't talk about the weird stuff. <laughs> and people see weird stuff. They see a UFO. They go to church. They get no explanation of what, how, what does a UFO fit into my Sunday sermon. So what do they do? They turn on ancient aliens. They're like, well, this is more this is more meat and potatoes for me. So I think, right, I think right, exactly. we're doing ourselves a disservice by not talking about weird topics like Bigfoot, aliens. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah, and then that's why I'm happy to come on and, and, and share these ideas. Yeah, we love this it. Is, this is why I want to get. I want to. Uh, I'm not satisfied with just Bigfoot. I want to go deeper. Yeah, me too. I want to know what, where, where did this come from? What are the origins? Why did all this happen? Yeah, yeah. I, I love it. We start out with the gi- giants are psychopathic. We talked about the, the lineage of Ham, and then we ended up somehow we ended up in a weird, weird, weird <laughs> UFO. I mean, this is just this is so blurry creatures, man. I love it. Yeah, tonight you're going to be going out and doing your biggest best Bigfoot call in your backyard. And- <laughs> yeah, get out. Yeah, you Who might, knows mate. what we started? Right. Who knows? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, no, we well, appreciate it. Yeah, Rich, thanks for coming on. Um, let our, let our listeners know where they can find your your work. Um, find you if they want if they want to send you an email or connect and give yourself a little plug here and um, okay. we'll wrap this thing um, up. You can find my uh, articles on academia.edu. Or the same articles are posted on my website, richardsorensen.com. That's S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N, <clears throat> richardsorensen.com. My two novels are available on Amazon, uh, Unholy Grail. You can look up that along with my name if you want to get in touch with me. 
My email address is rich, R-I-C-H, at westernness, and that's western, W-S-T-E-R-N-E-S-S-E dot com. And if you know anything about westernness, uh, you'll detect that I am a Tolkien aficionado. Uh, westernness is, a, is, the, is one of the words for heaven in that, in that novel series. Middle Earth, Nate. Middle Earth, that gets you going. That gives you that juice, Nate. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, some people say that he knew too much, so that's a... But that's an episode. <laughs> that's an episode for the future. Um, right. Yeah, I love it. I love. Well, I can. It. I can come back and talk about that. Yeah. Too. Right. yeah. yeah. It's another a whole Tolkien, <laughs> and then we can talk about the shroud and everything. Yeah, Luke and I were just talking right. about that the other day. That like maybe you know the age of when the hobbits they 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 knew something happened in the in the past, but you know the fires of Mordor started to burn again, and, uh-huh. and it sounds like we're right there. Like the the, the fires <laughs> are burning again, and there's a lot of people who don't know the story, right? Right. They don't know the weirdness of the history, but there's a couple hobbits that know this, and they're trying to get the word out. Right. So we appreciate you coming on our show, yeah. getting the word out about this stuff, um, <laughs> getting minds brewing, helping us uh, answer some of these questions. You know, not be uh, worried about the future, but s- ask some existential questions right. that that are hard to ask. <laughs> but Bigfoot will Bigfoot will do that to you. Right. He'll get you, he'll get you scratching your head and then and, and saying your prayers in a weird way. Right. <laughs> and I tell you, I'm not any any great scholar or any great writer. I'm just uh, one guy who has investigated this stuff, and I'm just pl- sort of plodding along, uh, trying to figure it all out. Yeah. So. Um, well, we're, we're glad to have you because we we are we're all the, rowing the same direction right now. <laughs> yeah. Right. More questions than answers. Well, Richard, thanks so much. Right. Next time you get upset with your wife luke think twice because it could be some genetic problem <laughs> that you, right. that you have, right? listen man if you're self-aware enough and you, then you have empathy i think i'm safe at this point yeah put that knife back in the drawer right. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> leave that gallon of milk on the shelf at kroger yeah, nate you klepto right. yeah let's yeah. do it <laughs> richard okay. until next time if you have any uh new discoveries or weird stuff or uh, anyone yeah just any more information on the giants feel free to hit us up with an email and you're welcome to come back okay. on anytime i love your uh open-mindedness but yet all your hardcore study into these topics it's a great blend of um not too many phds can talk about aliens and, and ufos and it's just it's it's great to be able to talk to uh someone with your accolades and also your open-mindedness so thank you mm-hmm. yeah, thank you Rich. thank you yeah. thank you for having me Appreciate it. All the best to you guys. Thank you yeah. much. And uh, I hope you guys have a have a huge impact on people. Appreciate it. Thanks. We'll uh, we'll let you know we'll let you know when the episode comes out. We, we, we need we need to impact people in, in any way that we can. Agreed. Agreed completely. And that's what we're that's trying. What we're just trying to do. We're trying to ask the questions and and you know and and just get you know I don't know just I don't know if it's red pill people necessarily but just give people really it would provide a space to talk about these things because I I believe this. The unknown and and the things that we can't really wrap our heads around or don't want to talk about with our friends or we feel like those kind of things will end, end up dying on the vine if you don't have a space, you know. To, to, right. to and and you were, I think you nailed it a hundred percent that like we're we're seeing a, a massive you know onslaught and war against the marketplace of ideas and mm-hmm. if we're not able to talk talk about our ideas and our opinions and talk them out and even, and even find the fallacies and things wrong in them. Or even open our minds a little bit. If we're, if we're not allowed that space or don't have that space, then we're really li- living in a, in a place where we're not able to grow a, a, as a society. And I, I fear that we're we're heading that direction. Um, right. That's a sad thing, but this thing is. Yeah, we're trying to be a beacon out here. So. Directly right. Yeah. All the best, you guys. We don't have our Sunday night book club. We got to get it going. No, we do. We do. I know. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Nate, you're not a big book reader, though. You're a book on tape guy. (laughs) I got too much ADD. I'm just like, what's what's that? Get that get that Walkman fired up. We've got hey, so Rich, we've got an '80s theme on our show. So a lot of because we're all we're '80s kids. So okay, that's cool. I like '80s. You'll hear it. You'll hear it. You'll hear it. We talk a lot about the. We talk a lot about. Sounds great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, thanks again. (laughs) Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for being on, for having me in the show. We'll see you now, guys.